Well, welcome back to the, uh, the sixth and the last of these uh, sessions on the Ten Commandments for uh, the Institute of Lutheran Theology Word at Work series. Uh, we will be making use of the, uh, both the small catechism and your Bible. And again tonight, there's a, a passage that's too big to fit on the screen, so you will actually need a Bible. Uh, this course was designed to be uh, both for adult study groups, but also for confirmation classes. And so we'll try to uh, address both of those groups as we go forward. Well, we're down to the last two commandments, and the ninth and 10th commandments deal with the same topic, but just uh, they're slightly different in them. Ninth commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And the 10th, shall not covet your neighbor's wife, workers, livestock, or anything that is your neighbor's. What's the difference between those two? And the 10th is? Okay. That is um, exactly backwards. <laughs> I mean, you're right, and it makes sense, but it's the other way around. Oddly enough, the ninth commandment is about the people in your life. House here means household, clan, family, the people around you. The tenth commandment has to do with property. And yes, sadly, in the ancient world, that included your wife. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they're speaking to the menfolk. Most ancient cultures were patriarchal. And so uh, the wife was considered property. Now, interestingly, in the other telling of the commandments, in Deuteronomy 5, they flip it around. The ninth commandment is, do not covet your neighbor's wife. And then the tenth one has all the property in it. So they, somebody figured that out, that that wasn't such a good arrangement there. Um, but the point is that one is about people, one is about property. Now, of course, people wonder, why two commandments that are so very, very similar here? And uh, the truth is that a lot of Protestants actually have just one commandment on coveting, and they go back and they split the first commandment into, you shall have no other gods, and you shall not make any graven images. This was actually hanging right out there in the hallway um, with the arrangement that's not in our good old Lutheran catechism. Well, the problem is that there, even though the Bible says there are ten commandments, truth told, there's not. There are either nine or there are eleven, but there aren't ten. And so you've got to split one or the other to get to ten commandments. And uh, Luther followed the practice of the Jewish rabbis and the Roman Catholic Church, which was to divide the tenth, ninth and tenth, the coveting commandment, into two. But much of the rest of the Protestant world followed John Calvin, uh, and the Reformed tradition, and that has been dominant in the United States. You go to any Christian bookstore and you will not find the commandments laid out the way that we teach them in the catechism. That dominant tradition has been to split the first and then to have just one commandment against coveting. So that's why there is that kind of confusion there, and now you can impress all the people at your next dinner party on why that's the case. Um, <laughs> So again, the question we've asked each time, if we're not going to do it, we should know what it is. What does it mean to covet? To want? To want something? De a desire, right. It is to, to want something desperately. <laughs> I mean, it's not just a casual sort of, oh, that'd be nice, but you know, whatever. It's, it's this deep, profound desire to have something in your life. But what then does it mean to hope? To hope for something. Might be, it might be wishful thinking, but it might just also be to want something desperately, <laughs> to desire it deeply. Um, we, they sound a lot alike, and yet, Hope is good. Coveting, bad. Enough that there are two commandments here against it. In fact, we can't live without hope. Um, it's necessary for life. One way of defining clinical depression is when someone has no more hope, for whatever reason. Uh, that they see no light at the end of the tunnel. 
If we don't have hope, there's no reason to get up out of bed in the morning and to keep going. We hope for our future. We hope for uh, relationships and for success. We hope for salvation and eternal life uh, through Christ. For many, many good things are the object of our hope. So we shouldn't covet, but we need hope to live. So how do you distinguish between the two? What is the difference between them? Exactly. It's something that, that doesn't belong to you or that you shouldn't even have. The difference here is not the emotion. It's not the desire or the feeling that you have, but rather it's the object of that feeling or desire. It is the thing that you want or the person that you want and desire so deeply. And the difference between coveting and hope is that coveting is hope gone bad. It's hope that's been turned onto and fixed onto someone or something that we cannot or should not have. Something that is out of bounds, off limits to us, and yet we fix our desires on it anyway. And the fact that we fix our hope on something that we can't or shouldn't have is what makes coveting so destructive. Because if you pursue it, it will generally lead to one of two really bad results. Either you'll waste your life chasing after an impossible dream. You know, that kind of sadness of someone who just can't get the picture of what is or isn't going to happen in their life. And they just keep going after the brass ring even though it's clearly out of reach. Or, even worse, we harm ourselves or others to get that thing that we desire. Um, or sometimes you see the combination of the two, like these mentally ill people who uh, get fixed on some celebrity or movie star. And in order to impress them, they go try to assassinate somebody, you know, and to finally get their attention. When you fix your hope on something that is out of bounds, that you cannot or should not have, nobody is safe. Not only the two that you know, are in this uh, relationship of coveting, but even other people can get dragged into that. So it becomes fairly important to distinguish uh, whether you're hoping or whether you're coveting. What is the difference between those two? Well, one more time, we're going to go back to that little summary statement in Luke 10. What did Jesus say about the law? How do you sum it up? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Here again, that's a pretty good gauge to distinguish between hoping and coveting. In fact, it's really the very best gauge. If the desire that you have, the hope that you have, uh, this deep longing that you have spurs you towards loving acts, that's hope. If uh, you do what it takes to get the education and the training to get your dream job. If you really buckle down and do your work in school to get the best grades and to get the scholarship, that's good. If your desire, your hope, your longing leads to loving actions to yourself or others, that's the kind of hope that we need to keep going, to have a purpose and a future in our life. But a desire that leads to harmful actions, either to ourselves or to others, is instead coveting. And then you have to start watching out for harm, again to ourselves or to others. I mean, you think, for example, of um, there was just an article in our local paper here a couple of weeks ago about uh, the way that the weight training program has just exploded at the school during the summers. Well, good for those young people to be disciplined, athletes going in and lifting to make themselves stronger, and nothing bad about that. Um, and a lot of us, frankly, could learn from them a little bit. But then you read the story about, that was just out a couple days ago, about the rampant use of human growth hormone and other steroids among that same group of people trying to get stronger, trying to get faster, trying to improve athletics. Well, you've just moved from hoping to coveting, because you're willing to do harm to yourself in order to reach your goal. 
a goal that you couldn't reach otherwise. Or again, uh, in the last uh, generation, there's been much more focus on fitness and staying in shape and watching weight. That's all good. It's better for us. But then when you find people, mostly girls, some guys, who are starving themselves, uh, slipping into bulimia or anorexia in order to get that thinner, 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 thinner look, you've switched from hoping to coveting. Um, and, and it's important to see here that there can be a kind of a fine line between the two. Sometimes it's just very, very clear, you know. But oftentimes what starts out as a good desire, if, if it starts to take control, it can just slide over. And that same desire or longing will start leading you to do dumb things that will either hurt you or hurt others. So what starts as hope can easily become coveting. And here again is where that second use of the law steps in, that exposes our sin and accuses us. Comes in and says, what's happened to your hope? Where is it now? What have you fixed it on? And is that right and good for you and for the others around you? But the criterion for deciding that is love toward ourselves and towards others. Well, again, the Bible has one of the most powerful, perhaps the best illustrations of how damaging coveting can be. And this, too, is much too long to put on the screens, but if you would turn to 2 Samuel 11, to the sad and tawdry tale of King David and Bathsheba. This uh, happens fairly late um, or later in David's life. And there's reason to believe that we have here in a case of an ancient midlife crisis going on. Uh, Israel is out at war and David is padding around in the palace in his bunny slippers for some reason. Probably because he's too long in the tooth to, to handle the rigors of battle anymore. So 2 Samuel 11 verse 2. Uh, we're going to read much of it, leave out a few verses there in the middle, as you can see. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now, these ancient houses were often, it was a warm climate, so they were built on a square, and the inner court was open to the air, and that's where you bathed. So it's not that Bathsheba is being risque here, or uh, in doing something she shouldn't. Dave, David just has the perspective <laughs> to see over the wall and see what's going on. David sends someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Interestingly, not an Israelite. He's a Hittite. He's an alien living in the land. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, which is biblical language for sexual intercourse. And then the editor says, by the way, she, she was purifying herself after her period, meaning what Bathsheba was doing was obeying the law of Moses. She was doing something faithful. Um, and so the, the author is making very clear that, that Bathsheba is not the wrongdoer here. She was doing exactly what she should have been doing. Well, then she returned to her house. The woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. ruh -roh. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? David sent word to Joab, that's his general, and a pretty uh, 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 ruthless man. Send me, Uriah, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared, how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Well, you know what the plan is. <laughs> He's been away at war. He comes home to his beautiful wife. You know, and then yada, 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 and nine months later, everyone says, oh, it looks just like Uriah. And we've solved the crisis, right? Well, no. Because Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king, but he slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Well, it's because the law says, if you're a soldier and you get called home from the front, but all of your comrades are still there, you live like you were still in the field. You don't enjoy all the comforts of home while your fellow soldiers are still enduring the hardship of the battlefield. 
Uriah, the Hittite, knows the law, and he obeys it. So David said, Uriah, I had you just come home from a journey. Uh, why did you not go down to your house? I mean, we men understand how these things work, right? Uriah said to David, well, yeah, I understand. The ark in Israel, of Israel and Judah remain in booths, that is, out in the field. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my home to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Uriah is shocked that David is not shocked um, at the thought that he would go down to his house. And David said to Uriah, okay, plan B. Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So he remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence, made him drunk. That'll certainly take away his inhibitions and his good character, right? He'll stumble home for sure. Nope. In the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set him in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. And Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting. Now drop to verse 22. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men gaining advantage over us came out against us in the field. We drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archer shot at your servants from the walls. Some of the king's servants are dead. Oh, and by the way, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Wink, wink. David said to the messenger, Oh, I got it. Thus you shall say to Joab, Don't let this matter trouble you. So you got waxed on the battlefield. No big deal. No worries. Press your attack on this. I mean, the sword devours now one and now another. We lost a soldier, you know, that happens. Press your attack on the city and overthrow it. And encourage him. That is Joab. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. Got away with it. It all worked. Except... The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. You can fool everybody except God. <laughs> to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Well, and as it goes on, um, God sends Nathan the prophet, and he just comes in and brilliantly corners David. Um, you got to go on and read 2 Samuel 12, but you got to do that on your own time. Um, so in this story, what did David covet? Bathsheba. Right, this beautiful woman. And of course, in the, in the ancient world, rightly or wrongly, kings could have all sorts of wives. Solomon is said to have had a thousand of them. Um, I can just imagine the cat fights in the dormitories there. Um, <laughs> but so the fact that he saw another woman was interested, you know, hubba hubba, you know, uh, wanted that. So that's not wrong. At what point did David's hope turn into coveting? When he had Uriah killed? I think it might have been before that. When he forced himself on her? Might have been before that. What? Well, yes, but th that's not quite it. It's that when he learned she was another man's wife. You see, the desire, the, the initial hope of, of wanting this beautiful woman as part of his, of, of his palace, the, in that context, there was nothing wrong with that. But his servants came and said, when he asked who she was, they said, this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And that should have been a big, honky, neon stop sign to David. Dag nabbit. <laughs> Darn the luck, she's already taken. I'll have to keep looking. Because he should have known that this is someone I cannot have and I should not have. You see that distinction we talked about earlier between hope and coveting. But when David continued to fix his hope 
on a person that he should not and could not have, his hope turned into coveting. And frankly, all hell broke loose because of it. He did call her to the palace. He did force himself on her. And again, you can't blame Bathsheba. When the king says jump, you say how high. Yeah, it's not an option. Uh, David is the one with all the power and the authority here. And so at the point that his hope turned into coveting, suddenly no one was safe. So try to catalog all the sins that arose from David's coveting. And once again, if you're watching the broadcast, you may want to pause it and have this discussion among yourselves. Go back into the text and see what all is there. But this is at least a, a beginning list. He misused his royal power. And this is one of the things that Nathan comes and, or God says to him through Nathan. I plucked you out of the obscure pastures of Bethlehem, gave you the throne and the whole kingdom. You could have anybody you wanted, and you had to take this poor man's wife. And you used the royal power I gave you to do that? It was a horrible abuse of power, which was a direct gift from God. Obviously, he committed adultery. But not only him, he forced it on Bathsheba too. I mean, she became an adulterer, but through no choice of her own. As we saw, he tried to get Uriah to break his religious vows. And don't you just love the delicious irony that Uriah the Hittite, the alien living in the land, knows the law better than David does. Certainly more committed to the law than David is. And when Uriah turned out to be the straightest of straight arrows, then David conspired to murder him. And, and you want to talk about bitter, poignant irony. That David wrote the letter condemning Uriah to death and sent it by his own hand back to the battlefield. And how was he able to do that? He knew that Uriah was too straight an arrow to peek inside and see what it said. He played on his integrity and used it against him. Uriah has the integrity. David here shows himself to have none. And of course, Uriah is murdered in a way to cover it up in war, but it is murder because they left him alone, withdrew, so that he was the only one left at the front. And in, in hatching that plot, David drew all sorts of others into it. Joab and the messenger. Um, the other uh, uh, soldiers beside Uriah who got the word to pull back and leave him alone. I mean, all sorts of other people got drawn in. So you go back to our criterion for determining hoping and coveting, it's pretty clear that David's desire for Bathsheba led to all sorts of harmful actions and not any good ones. So what began as hope morphed into coveting. And when David didn't stop, nobody was safe. Including, as it turns out, David himself. Because God sends Nathan after him, who brilliantly convicts him, and then David, to his credit, repents. He confesses his sin, mourns before God, but the consequence is this son that Bathsheba bore to him died. Uh, so he too was affected by his own covetousness. So this text shows that if these commandments against coveting were not there to limit our desires, to keep them fixed on the appropriate kind of objects and not things that we couldn't or shouldn't have, then nobody is safe and others will get hurt. Now please understand this story about adultery, this is only one of the things that we can covet. <laughs> I mean, these can be everything like, you know, from some job that you think you're going to get even though you're not qualified for it, down to your neighbor's boat. You know, I mean, there are all sorts of things that you can fix on as an object of coveting. This is, it's not, it's not the fact that he coveted a woman, it's just what coveting did in this situation that makes it such a powerful illustration. So these ninth and 10th commandments protect us in three important ways. They pre protect us first from one another. I mean, the truth is that if you love what your neighbor has, more than you love your neighbor, neither of you are safe. 
If you love what your neighbor has more than you love your neighbor, you're both going to get hurt. You can count on it. And scheming to get what isn't ours or shouldn't be ours, doesn't belong to us, destroys the kind of trust that actually holds society together. It's tremendously destructive. And as we saw, David's desire didn't just harm him, but many others as well. Secondly, it protects us from ourselves. It reminds us, stop, even though David didn't when he should have. It can prevent those two bad results we talked about earlier, wasting your life chasing a brass ring you're never going to get, or harming yourself or others to get something that you shouldn't have. Um, even sometimes to get what you want can have, like David, really bad consequences. You know, for confirmation students who are thinking about getting their driver's license, what's the very next thing you want? A car. I want my own car. Well, that's great, except if, as they should, your parents make you feed and baby the thing and pay for the insurance, and pretty soon you're working every free hour just to pay for the thing, and then where was all the freedom you were going to have once you got that car? Who's the master and who's the servant here? And, of course, it's not just kids. How many Americans have chased the dream and ended up with an entire house full of toys that then have to be maintained and paid for and taken care of and you don't even have time to use them because you're running in circles? I mean, sometimes even when we get what we desire, it boomerangs on us if it's beyond the bounds of what's loving, what's good for us, what's necessary. And finally, they protect our relationship with God. The coveting commandments. Protect our relationship with God. Because a covetous desire inevitably becomes our God. It takes the place of the one true living God and it becomes that idol that controls our lives. And you see that clearly in David. David was otherwise a pretty faithful guy. But once this coveting took over and then he had to protect himself and the conspiracy started, it was just it was out of control. It became his God and he served it to an extraordinary extent. I mean, really, the main message of the commandments against coveting is that unless God is the central love in your life, you're never going to be content or happy. Now, I emphasize central, not only. Not the only love in your life. Of course, we have all sorts of other loves. But the central one that place that calls the shots. We all have a need for God that only God can fill. And people, being sinners, try to fill it with all sorts of other things, from work to success to drugs to whatever, possessions, drugs, but it never works for more than a very brief period of time, and then it just gets worse and worse. The great St. Augustine uh, wrote one of the first autobiographies, his confessions, and he was a wild child up until about his mid-twenties. And um, eventually then was uh, called by God, converted to the faith, become, became one of the greatest theologians of the church. But in thinking back on that whole process of his life, in his confessions, he wrote this very famous phrase where he said, Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. Our hearts are restless, restless, not satisfied, not content, not happy, not secure, until they rest in you. Unless God is the central love in our lives, we're not ever going to be content and happy. And so these covenant commandments tell us not to do two things. Don't fix your desire on what isn't yours or that you can't get honestly and helpfully. But just as important, this is sort of the flip side of it, don't invest your God in his promises to you, God in the identity he has given you in Christ. Anchor yourself there. Center yourself there. And then a lot of these other things start to fall into perspective. You realize they're not God's. They may be good, they may be not so good, and you can you know, choose between them more effectively. So we're called to trust God 
and to be content with what we have been given. Not content in the sense of being passive. There's nothing wrong with some ambition, with trying to better yourself, with trying to work hard. But content in terms of trusting that God is going to give us what we need and has blessed us to get us there. All right, well, the Ten Commandments have a conclusion as well as an introduction. You remember what the introduction was, all of you, don't you? The promise, I am the Lord your God. Exactly right. And it's out of that promise that all the commandments grow. Well, there is a conclusion, too, that reads like this. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands or to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commands. Not really a cheery note to end on. <laughs> and that's a pretty solemn warning to love God and to keep the commandments. God is not fooling around here. And yet, it might seem a little strange to you because we have discovered through studying these commandments that we can't keep them, at least not completely, not perfectly. That's the second use of the law. It'll just keep coming after us. And so reading this threat could make God come off as a little vengeful or, or petty or cruel or unfair. I mean, first he sets up rules that no one can live up to, uh, in his eyes, and then says, but if you don't, I'll not only get you, I'll get your kids and your grandkids too. I mean, really? So what does this kind of awful sounding conclusion to the Ten Commandments mean? Well, first of all, it shows how seriously God takes the commandments. And when we look around the world or look deep into our hearts and see how unseriously we often take them, that's a necessary stiff reminder. God is not kidding about this. He takes the commandments very seriously. Now, if you look at the first half of the meaning to the conclusion in the small catechism, God threatens to punish all who violate these commandments. We should therefore fear his anger and in no way disobey them. It's a serious business. And the inability to keep them perfectly is no excuse not to try, <laughs> to strive, to make that effort. We can't scam God using his grace as an excuse to continue to sin. I mean, they tried that in Rome, uh, Romans 6. Paul says, should we sin the more so that grace may abound? You know? We like to sin, God likes to forgive, we can keep each other very busy and happy here. Um, no, no. And, and we gotta be honest, the old Adam, the sinner in us, makes sin look so attractive, so much fun. But the thrill is fleeting, temporary at best. And then sin starts to bite and to do its harm in us. At the same time though, I think it's really important to see that this threat, this conclusion, is more of a description than a prescription. What's the difference between those two? A description tells how something is. It describes what is. A prescription does what? Tells how things ought to be. You go to the doctor, he writes you a prescription, he says, take this medicine this often and this dosage for this long. That's what ought to happen. It lays out the future. Well, when God says, I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation, he's not prescribing that as something he wants to happen, as his goal or purpose. He was rather describing the actual effects of sin in this world. And the truth is that in many cases, our sins don't stop with us. They affect the next generation and sometimes the next generation. And people who work with family systems will tell you that those kind of generational things are so hard to break. I mean, you would think, for example, that a child raised in an alcoholic home would stay as far away from anything addictive as they possibly could. It's just the opposite. They're more susceptible 
to addiction themselves. Same thing with abuse, the same thing with all sorts of other uh, social ills. If you experience, you're more susceptible to it. Our sins don't stop with us. They carry on to the next generation. And so this conclusion, as harsh as it sounds, as frightful as it is, is simply describing the consequences of rebelling against God. This is what happens. So, don't do it. <laughs> Take these commandments seriously. Yes, it sets an impossibly high bar, and it does threaten us with God's anger, but again, it does so in order to drive us to repent, to turn from our sin, to cling to Christ alone as our Savior. It's the second use of the law. Also at work here even in the conclusion, uh, not just in a commandment. And again, that's really important because finally only Jesus' forgiveness can truly free us from sin and guilt. And this is the true freedom, you know, that only Christ can bring. True freedom is not the freedom to sin or to be casual about obedience to be free to do whatever you want. True freedom is following Christ as our Lord, serving him in the joy of his saving grace. Not out of some uh, fear, but out of love. Love for him as our Savior and Lord. And so in the second half of the meaning uh, in the Catechism, God promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. We should therefore love him, trust in him, and gladly keep his commandments. Because he has decided to be our God. And he is the author of life. Still, at the same time, as we uh, deal with this, the reason for this warning at the end may also seem a little odd. God said, I am a jealous God. I mean, what do you think of when you hear jealousy? Is that a good thing? Oh, it's one of those really negative emotions, you know, insecurity and fear and possessiveness and uh, uh, envy and resentment of others. I mean, we usually think of jealousy as one of the most negative things in the world. And then we hear God saying, I'm a jealous God. Like, ooh, doesn't seem to fit. But God is not like that. And this isn't the human kind of jealousy at all. Rather, God being jealous means two other things instead. It means that God's love for you is intense and all-consuming. To the point that God sent his only son to take on human flesh and to die on the cross in order to rescue you from sin and death, to put your old Adam to death and to create you new in Christ Jesus you get no half-hearted commitment from God. Right out of the chute, he declared, I am the Lord your God, you're mine, and I'm going to do my saving work in you. But then consequently, God wants intense, all-consuming love back from you. If you don't get a half-hearted commitment from God, God doesn't want a half-hearted commitment from you. That's what the jealousy means. It's like, we're in this seriously. We're in this for keeps. God wants to be the center and the driving force of your life so that you do in fact love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. That's why if you go back to Exodus 20 rather than the Catechism, you'll find that this conclusion is attached to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. I mean, to love God properly is to love God exclusively uh, as the only God in our life. Now, Luther moved it to the end as a conclusion in the Catechism because it does apply to all the commands. Um, and, and it fits there. It's all, all the commandments are part of loving God and uh, committing to him. But it's interesting that uh, Exodus attaches it to the first commandment as a way of driving home that God is our God and therefore, there's room for no others. 
Now, in the time we have left here, I just want, this is as close as you're going to come to taking a test. You, you don't, uh, we're not actually going to uh, put you through that. But I want to do a little case study with you um, of how all this stuff that we've talked about uh, worked out in, in one real life situation, and I hope you can see reflected in that uh, other real life situations. It's a case study of how the law works. If you would, and this again is too long to put on the screens, if you would turn to Mark chapter 10, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. Mark 10, 17. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Well, uh, what did the rich man uh, who comes to Jesus seem to think was the way to inherit eternal life. Keeping the commandments. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He understands this as a project. It's his responsibility. And he needs to know uh, what the secret formula is here. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response to him may sound a little odd, even a little cold, for a couple of reasons. I mean, first he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. I'm like, sorry, <laughs> having a bad day or what? Um, what do you think Jesus meant by that? Especially when he himself, you know, declared he was the son of God. Uh, we believe as Christians he was without sin. Why would he sort of snap back at the rich man? It might, he may have sent some flattery, that the man was just flattering him to try to get on his good side. But I think also it's a kind of a warning to the rich man to say, look, no human being can be as good as God. This notion that you can follow the law until you have warranted eternal life, until you have made yourself acceptable to God, isn't going to work. Don't use me as some kind of role model or some kind of goal to follow. You can't be. No one is truly, perfectly good except God alone. That should have been a huge clue to this rich man in terms of what he was asking. But then, having made the point, Jesus turns right around and sends him back to the commandments. You know what the commandments are, and he ticks off about six of them. Doesn't that seem to contradict his first statement? No one can be good by following the law. Okay, here's the law, go do it. What? I mean, it seems to be the ultimate appeal to effort and obedience. But there is a method to Jesus' madness here, apparent madness. How did the rich man respond to Jesus? When he said, you know the commandments, here they are. I've done all these from my youth. Now, having been well educated in the Ten Commandments, you know that can't possibly be true. <laughs> I mean, how often have we emphasized the second use of the law, that it just keeps raising the bar, that it accuses of our sin, that you can't get there no matter what you do, and here this guy says, oh, kept all of them, doing great. But it's really important to understand here that the man was not just being arrogant or clueless or even necessarily self-righteous. 
Note that every one of the commandments Jesus named to him comes out of the second table. Those having to do with horizontal relationships with one another. How we live in community. And while the second use of the law exposes our sin and accuses us, what's the, perp- what's the first use of the law? What does that do? Keeps good order in society. Helps us live together safely. And at that level, we can keep the commandments. <laughs> Why well, most of us say we've never killed, we've never stealed, and you know, we try not to lie about people. I mean, with a little effort, you can do the first use. And so in that sense, that's how the rich man is understanding. He's saying, look, Lord, I've been trying, I've been working hard all my life. I have been following God's law in how I have lived my life. He's thinking first use of the law here almost entirely. So likely he was very sincere about this, even accurate in a way. I have tried to live my life in an ethical, uh, good manner uh, and avoid breaking these commandments. See, but here's where Jesus is three steps ahead of him all the way. Because he's using the man's very sincerity to try to move him past. To show him a new level of what's going on here. And that's the strategy that Jesus uses next. What does he tell him then to do in verse 21? When he says, I've kept all the laws? You're missing one thing. Just missing one thing. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come and see me, and we'll see how you're doing. Then you can follow me. So, he's supposed to give everything away, and he's a rich man, we know that. It sounds again like this, you know, ultimate appeal to effort and obedience. And the guy is clearly a committed believer. He's, he's a committed Jewish believer. He's been working hard at the law all of his life. So, imagine you don't know how it turned out. If he had taken Jesus up on it, if he'd gone and sold everything and given it away, would that have done it? Would he have inherited eternal life? Not necessarily. <laughs> We're hedging our bets on the left side of the room. Um, I mean... Most people that I've asked that question through the years say, well, sure. That's what Jesus told him to do. If he just obeyed him, all would have been well. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Well, he didn't. We're thinking hypothetically here. Right. No, he, he wasn't giving him a promise, but he was giving him a command. He was giving him a task. And the question is, if he had done it, if he had done it, if he had obeyed at that point, would that have done the trick? Now, you guys are jumping ahead of the game here. What would have happened if he had obeyed Jesus? Well, we, we can't know. That's true. But logically, you would say, Jesus said, do this. So I did that. That ought to take care of it, right? And many people will say, yeah, well, that's exactly right. Except here's the curious thing. I've never had one person who said, yep, that's the ticket, who then went out and sold everything they had and gave the money to the poor. I mean, if we really thought that was the ticket, I mean, wouldn't we all have a garage sale, including the garage? Yes. Exactly, exactly right. The instructions would have been different to someone else. What Jesus is doing here is going after his Achilles heel. Um, He was shifting him from the first use to the second use of the law. This guy was operating mentally, theologically, entirely under that first use, and Jesus is shifting him over to be exposed to the second use, and he goes after the one thing that he knew he couldn't do. And that's why this question I was trying to ask earlier is totally hypothetical, because Jesus knew before he asked it that he wouldn't be able to do it. You see, he was unleashing the second use of the law on him precisely to crush the man's self-righteousness, his self-reliance, his sense that this was a project he had to complete and a test that he had to pass. And so Jesus asks him to do the one thing that he knows he could never possibly do. 
And the reason Jesus knew it is not only his insight into people, but in Jewish thinking of the time, wealth was understood as a sign that you were really in tight with God. He approved of you, and so he had blessed you, and that's why you're wealthy and doing well. And so for this Jewish man here, so to get right with God, I have to get rid of all, everything God has given me? No, that's nuts. And he goes away grieving. You're absolutely right that this is targeted exactly at the rich man and someone else whose hope was fixed somewhere else, whose confidence was based in something else, Jesus would have made a different demand. But this is the one thing he knew the man could never do. And so he went away shocked and grieving. And the story ends there. We never hear another word about him. We hope at some point he came back, encountered Jesus again. But Jesus was willing to let him go because the law still needed to do its work on him. The law still had to drive him to God for mercy and eventually to Christ and his cross. Well, I think this is a, a, a wonderful sort of test case of how this, all that we've talked about here with these Ten Commandments. I mean, the old Adam, the old Eve, the sinner within us, doesn't like being a creature. Doesn't like being dependent on God. And so we naturally try to use the law to prove ourselves to God. We either prove ourselves by saying, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do my own thing. Or, like the rich man, we say, I'll prove to you how holy and righteous and obedient and faithful I am until you approve of me. But in either case, we're staying in control of the project. We're looking at it as a project rather than a relationship. But the law cannot save. Not just that it doesn't, it can't. It wasn't its purpose. The law only has these two purposes. Keep order in society and drive us to Christ. Because Christ can save us when the law cannot. And so just as this rich man, God, through the law, will go after our Achilles heel too. Maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's, uh, I, I don't know, we can create a long list of things. But God will go after that one thing that we're hanging on to for dear life to say, but this I'll use to show God. They go, shh, shh, shh. I don't think so. But the whole purpose of that is so that finally we have no, no choice, nothing left, but to cling to Christ and his cross, to throw ourselves on his mercy, because only God is truly merciful and forgives sin and restores us. And so as believers, yes, we strive to obey the commandments, but not because we must or we're trying to prove ourselves to God or that's the way to inherit eternal life. We do it because God has decided to be our God. And out of love and honor and respect, we strive to do what God has told us is best for us and for others. We're certainly not trying to impress God, fat chance of that. <laughs> Instead, it grows out of love, out of the decision that God has made to be our God. But as we strive to do that out of love, the law isn't and cannot be the means of salvation. Christ Jesus is the means of salvation. Even perhaps it's at its most subtle level, you will hear devout Christian people say something like, well, yes, I mean, Christ died on the cross for you, but at least you have to believe. Well, where are you putting your faith? Into your faith. Your faith is in Christ Jesus, not in yourself. We don't believe in our belief. We believe in Christ. So whatever it is that we cling to as sort of our way of, of proving ourselves, God will come and say, no, 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 no. That's not going to do it. You need Christ and Christ alone. As Romans 3 declares, we are justified by faith alone apart from works of the law. Apart from anything we can do to try to uh, offer up to God as our spiritual resume. And that's why the end of this class can't be the end. Because we're left with those shoulds. We should, therefore, fear his anger in no way. I know that. <laughs> How does that help me? 
We should, therefore, love him, trust him, gladly keep his commandments. I know. Give me a break here. When we're left with a should, we're left to our own devices. And we're still in the corner. So that's why the catechism goes on. From the should to what God has done for us to how those gifts come to us. And so we begin here in the first section with the commandments, but this isn't and can't be the end, even as we draw these sessions to a close. And uh, we may yet uh, be broadcasting some of those parts of the catechism as well. So our time is up. Uh, we'll draw the uh, broadcast to a close, but uh, both here and wherever you may be watching it, we invite you to have some discussion about this. But uh, thank you all for taking the journey, and uh, God's grace and peace be with you all. Thank you. <laughs>